Yes, uh, hello and good evening in this case. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, today I want to give you a Christmas present, early Christmas present for the patrons, Christmas present for everybody else. It's uh, the third episode of EV Fundamentals and I think today is the, the, actually the real fundamental. It's how does the inverter control the induction motor? So, stay tuned. Um, <clears throat> oh, this is really fancy today. It's basically a triple camera setup today. So, let me introduce to you camera number two. Um, so, this creative mess uh, contains an STM32 board somewhere buried down in there hooked up to an analog discovery that simulates motor feedback and uh, gives us some nice pictures. And here we have uh, our trusty benchtop multimeter set to frequency mode. And I'm just going to leave the second camera resting here so you can see the frequency meter. And for now we're going to shut off my prepared patterns here. Give us zero hertz. Okay, um, <clears throat> I found very good videos on uh, induction motor operation on YouTube, and I will link one in down below, so I don't uh, have to repeat it at a much lesser quality, even though I have three cameras. Um, so let me empty the, the rotor for you. The induction motor's rotor, if it spins at a speed of um, 10 Hz, you want your field to spin at, say, 11 Hz to actually, um, yeah, basically transform some of the current over to the stator, uh, to the rotor, and uh, have that generate your magnetic field, which is the force that keeps a uh, rotor and stator together. And that's uh, the basic idea. And apart from that, <clears throat> every motor um, or every yeah, every like synchronous, asynchronous um, induction motor usually runs off three phases, three AC phases, three sine wave phases. And um, they are arranged uh, at equidistant. So, first sine wave starts at 0 hertz, second sine wave starts at um, 120 hertz, and third one at 240 hertz. And that's a given constant. There, there won't be a four phase sync, uh, sim system. There will not be an, a phase offset of 90 hertz for some reason. It's always three phase, 120 degrees apart. So it's a constant we can rely on. And we will find that uh, it's a constant that microcontroller manufacturers rely on as well when they create their peripherals. Um, another given is uh, the, the fact that uh, the, the resistance of an inductor is linear to the frequency you put in it. So if an inductor says, whatever, 10 ohms at 10 hertz, it's going to be 20 ohms at 20 hertz. So to maintain the same current at 10 or 20 hertz, you have to double the voltage. So if it's 10 volts at 10 hertz, it's 20 volts at 20 hertz. And those are the, the key fundamentals of driving an induction motor. And you haven't heard me talking about current measurement, because you don't need it. Uh, but you have heard me talking about the rotor speed. And that's what we do need. That's what we need to sense. Okay, so let's um, get into it a bit more detailed. So I've uh, set up my analog discovery to power the STM32 with a power supply function here. Um, <clears throat> I have set up the, the pattern generator to generate um, the encoder signal for me, uh, signal channel signal for 
sake of simplicity. And I've set up the inverter to accept single channel encoder signals and uh, add 30 pulses per rotation. Uh, no, 60. And 60 is quite convenient because it's uh, basically uh, the same ratio as between RPM and rotations per second. So if I, uh, if I now supplied a frequency of 3 kilohertz, um, that would be a 50 hertz, like hertz uh, rotation. So you can always describe the motion of the rotor, the, the velocity, as rotations per minute or rotations per second. 3000 per minute is 50 per second. Okay, so we've uh, set it up. Um, I have started the inverter in what's called manual mode. We don't have to simulate throttle and, and that. We can just enter values right here. <coughs> So right now, um, the slip set point, which is uh, the offset I talked about, when we're spinning at 10 hertz here, we want uh, 11 hertz uh, going around if we want to accelerate, or, or 9 hertz if we want to decelerate. So that's uh, this parameter right here, and amp norm is our relative amplitude to be one. Yeah, like uh, it, it changes over frequency. We can just choose if it's uh, between zero and 100 percent. And I've set it to 100%, and uh, as you can see right now, there's nothing going on because I've stopped the pattern generator. So let's simulate a slow movement. Um, let's say, uh, yeah, 100 RPM equals 100 Hertz. Oops, not cooperating with me. Okay, so before I start, what do we expect? Um, let's look at the parameters once more. Um, so I've pole pass that set to one. Um, don't worry about it right now, it's just uh, for, for ease of explanation. Um, <clears throat> so 100 RPM divided by 60 is roughly... Oh, yeah, my math isn't too good at that time of the day. So... 100 divided by 60. So as soon as I turn on the pattern generator, we expect a frequency of 1.6 Hertz on the frequency counter right there. And on our display right here, and also on the scope, if it picks it up. Let's see. Pattern on. And we're getting yeah, like <laughs> close to 1.6 hertz, it can't decide. Um, let's take a look at what the scope thinks of it. Yeah, it, it doesn't pick up low frequencies like that. I have to change the time base to some really ridiculously high value. Ah, not too bad. Um, so yeah, the scope has a better uh, grasp of it, 1.6 hertz, like predicted. And likewise, we should see 1.6 Hz on the inverter display. Um, yeah, 1.65, perfect. Mm, okay, so right now um, the inverter is just replicating what it sees on the motor because we have uh, set the slip to 0 Hz. Now for further experiments, let's um, maybe yeah, increase uh, the, the the speed a bit. Let's go to 500 hertz. Okay, and now the multimeter picks up a clean 8.3 hertz, and we should see 8.3 hertz also on the scope. Yep. Time based down a bit. Okay, so now let's see what happens if we add some slip. Um, no, that's not right. Let's add one hertz of slip. 
And surprise, we hit 9.3 hertz pretty much. Likewise here. Okay, so now let me demonstrate uh, the, and uh, maybe for ex ease of explanation, let's remove the, the boost and uh, just keep it like that. So now at, um, yeah, let's, let's make it 10 hertz. 10 hertz would be 600 RPM, 600 hertz on the encoder, 600, 600. And yeah, it's it's more than ten because it adds the slip. There seems to be a bit of uh, rounding errors on my slip frequency calculation. Um, so let's remove that to get a clearer view. Okay, so now we have ten hertz and we have an amplitude of uh, one hundred and thirty-four millivolts. Um, of course, that figure would be amplified by our, by our actual power stage, but at 10 Hz, it's 134, whatever unit, could be volts. So, if we double the frequency, should we double the voltage? I think we should. So, let's double it to 1200. So remember 134 now, what do we expect? 260, 268. Let's have a look. Bam, right on, 268. Yeah, so all we did was um, yeah, increase the voltage with the frequency, proportion to the frequency. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking that should be enough hands-on stuff for now. Let's take a look at the code. Okay, so this is the routine. I'll scale it up for you a bit here. That takes care of generating the sine wave we just saw. And in fact, well, maybe let's go back to this code one more time. Um, of course, the microcontroller doesn't generate. Oh, what's that? Yeah, there's a cable in here. Hmm. Oh no! <laughs> because of the time base, it's starting to uh, to actually low pass filter. Um, so let's. Yeah. So actually, the blue line is what the inverter generates, and then the motor basically low pass filters this. Uh, bunch of square waves and uh, makes a sine wave from it. So if we look at it from the larger time base, we get the picture we saw earlier. Yeah, the yellow one. So that's what the model sees. Uh, you can see these funny little dents. Um, it's, so it doesn't look sinusoidal, uh, if, so to speak, but um, this is called space vector modulation. Fancy name for something that's quite um, obvious also. Um, if you basically you want to, to generate the maximum AC amplitude from a given DC voltage and it turns out if you just generate uh, sine waves you will not get the most possible amplitude so what you do is you shift your neutral potential like up and down a bit um, in order to achieve the full uh, voltage and that makes it look funny but uh, since you just shift the neutral potential from face to face it will look absolutely sinusoidal. Just believe it, I don't want to go into it now and uh, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, the routine that takes care of it all. It's being called um, at the PWM frequency which in this case, let's take a look is 17.6 kilohertz. So it's called 17,600 times per second to calculate new 
what's called duty cycles or new output voltages. Um, yeah, ignore the if and stuff, it's just for different modes. Um, so first you want to know the direction that we're spinning in. Mm. <coughs> we update, uh, we yeah, instruct the encoder module to read the current uh, angle of the rotor. And yeah, this is some current limiting, don't worry about it for now. And we are looking at asynchronous modes today. Also because that's uh, actually the proven algorithm. And so we will jump into calculate next angle async. So at every little time increment, we calculate our sine wave at a new angle. Say um, we start out at zero degrees and now 17.6, no, what's that? 60 microseconds later, we go into the same routine again and we have to find out which angle is the rotor now, which additional angle do we have to add to generate slip, mm -hmm. and therefore we calculate a new angle and that may result in, I don't know, 10 degrees, and then we just output a sine wave, three phase sine wave, at 10 degrees. Um, so let's look at this sub method for a second. I don't think it's too complex. No, it's not. Um, ignore pole pairs for now. Just, you know, some rotors take two or more um, sine wave iterations to make one full turn. Simple math. Um, so we read the current rotor angle from the encoder module. We calculate the frequency. So the frequency is the current rotor frequency plus the slip frequency that we want to add on top of it. And then we have like um, a little counter that generates our slip frequency. So um, the rotor spins by itself and the slip angle, that's what we make spin in software. So at each little increment we add a bit of increment, so it's like a slowly spinning sine wave, right? or a slowly single uh, spinning angle, whatever, yeah, angle that uh, yeah spins at the slip frequency, like one hertz or two hertz, so it makes like one rotation per second. And that's just superimposed in the next line onto our rotor angle. That's it. Okay, so now we've calculated the angle that we want to uh, output to our PWM generators. And let's scroll back up. And we've also determined the frequency of our rotor and plus slip frequency. So now we get the voltage that we want to output because that's proportional, like I said, to the frequency. And we uh, also multiply, like internally we multiply this by a percentage. Um, so if you only want, say, eh, like 50% torque, we go into this function with a 50% figure. Okay, now we go to our sine core and we tell it to use an amplitude of whatever we just calculated here. So that's internal quantities, it's not like between 0 and 1, but it's between 0 and 3, 7, some, some weird number, it doesn't matter. That's internals. Um, and then we write various info to the data module, so we can see it on the Wi-Fi module. And now we call the calculate function, and we might want to step into that. Let's scale it up a bit. So, calculate. Um, so now we have our 10 hertz angle. So we calculate three sine waves. One at 10 hertz, one at 10 hertz per 120, so 130 hertz, and one at 250 uh, degrees. 10 degrees, 130 degrees, 250 degrees. And we do a bit of magic to, uh, to handle like wrapping 
of our data types. Okay, then we take all of these uh, three sine waves and we uh, set the amplitude. So they come from the sine lookup at full amplitude and now we scale them down to whatever amplitude we, we want. Then we do the funny little dents. Here, yeah, these ones. The space vector PWM offset. And that offset is being subtracted from all three. So you see, between the three it cannot make a difference. And now, up to this point, we have a assigned number. So it's between... yeah, it's assigned. And of course we cannot have negative duty cycles. Instead, um, we define that our zero voltage is when we have 50% duty cycle. That's zero volts above zero volts, positive voltage below zero volts. Uh, negative voltage, yeah. Um, no, above 50%, Jesus, it's getting late. Uh, above 50% positive voltage, below 50% negative voltage. So we just add a an offset to all... Uh, oops, missing the underscore here. There it is. Another offset to all three duty cycles. And then we do some power electronic specials. Um, we could end up with a duty cycle that's really small, like, I don't know... Uh, 0.5% say, and then we would be switching our um, IGBT on and off again. And that might actually lead to it never actually being on. It's, it's switched off so fast that it never had a chance to turn on. And that might actually overheat it. I've heard of cases that this is supposed to happen. Um, so basically, if our duty cycle that we calculated is too small, we just set it straight, uh, straight to zero. That means we don't even attempt to switch the RGBT on. And uh, likewise, if we have a very large duty cycle, RGBT would be on, off and on again. That has the same problem. Um, we just switch it on all the time. And it turns out, um, with this modulation scheme, um, that actually 30% of the time an RGBT will be full on or full off. So we reduce switching losses by 30% by, by doing this. Um, yeah, so that's, that's cool. Um, so now we have our three duty cycles and they are normalized <coughs> um, to like to, 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 to 16 bits. And of course, depending on our PWM frequency, our timer um, registers will not accept uh, 16 bits, but less bits. Um, I think at the frequency we're running at now, 17.6 uh, kilohertz, it accepts 11 bits. So we have to get rid of five bits, and that's what we do right here. And then there's a bit of optimization. If we, I said, 50% um, duty cycle means uh, zero volts. And there's, actually, if you do this, uh, you do generate a lot of EMC for some reason that I cannot explain because I don't know. Um, so it's better if you're not outputting a useful voltage anyway to just shut down your PWM entirely and just, uh, yeah, thereby reduce noise generation. Okay, so finally when we've done all these calculations we feed our duty cycles to the hardware registers and they will generate our PWM waveform, the blue one. Let's take a look at it again. I think it's still running. Yeah, that's what uh, comes out from the STM32. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's it really about basic motor control. Um, so what you can see is that we are not using the current sensors, there's no analog quantities in this uh, procedure, except 
Yeah, that's a relatively new feature. Um, it's a software current limiter. So far we only had like a hardware current shutdown actually. So if you, I don't know, get a faulty encoder signal or if you program uh, insane uh, parameters and whatever causes an overcurrent, we would just uh, shut down the inverter. And now this was an attempt to, oh, it's, it's quite convoluted, let's not go over it. This was an attempt to reduce the sine amplitude and also the slit angle, that's uh, inside here, um, before even generating an overcurrent event, just to have a more reliable operation. And yeah, what I should also mention is, uh, as I said, we reduce the slip angle. Mm, the more slip you put into the motor, the more um, energy is transferred onto the rotor and it um, generates a strong magnet magnetic field and therefore we can generate more torque. And at some point um, the frequency that arrives at the rotor is so high that actually the inductance of it attenuates the signal and then uh, we have passed what's called the breakdown point. Then we the torque declines again. Um, yeah, and there's all sorts of slip frequencies. There's an optimal slip frequency for a given op operating point that yields the best um, uh, torque per amp ratio. There's slip frequencies for optimal power factor and yeah, all sorts of uh, things. But in general, what we can say. Um, the lower the slip frequency, the higher the efficiency. Don't, I mean, don't take it literally. Uh, zero uh, slip will not uh, be very efficient, and also very low slip is also not very efficient. But if you choose between like 1 and 3 hertz of slip, 1 hertz will certainly be more efficient for most models out there. Okay, um, that should be it for today. Um, at this point, to everybody, to all my patrons especially, thanks for supporting me. I started the campaign in, in March uh, this year and quite a lot of people have been bearing with me. And I'm very grateful for that and it just motivates me to make these videos, motivates me to do stuff like I showed you before. And the same motivation, if not funds, comes from YouTube. If you leave a like, if you leave, uh, leave a subscription, that's great. Makes me want to go on. So, Merry Christmas and see you next time. Bye-bye.